High Street Young Adults, how we doing? You guys doing all right? Man, uh, I'm just so excited to be here tonight to just get to share, uh, share something with you guys. And uh, if, you have, if we haven't met, my name is Ryan. Uh, I'm a resident here at High Street, and I've just had the privilege of, uh, of getting to just serve in this, uh, in this ministry for the past 11 months, eight, eight or nine months at this point. And I'm just really excited to be here with you guys tonight to just talk about something that's honestly really important to me, something that uh, was life-changing for me. And I hope it is for somebody here tonight before we leave. And so I want to start off by asking you this. Have you ever believed something to be true or were told something that you believed to be true and you didn't find out for like years later that it was a lie? Can you think of something like that? I think I know one that everybody in here, a lie that everybody in here believed at some point in your life. And it's kind of messed up because it was a lie that like the people we looked up to told us, like our parents and our teachers and our grandparents, everybody that we looked up to, they, they, they fed into this lie and really it was to like manipulate our behavior, right? Like it's kind of messed up if you think about it. And uh, I, I bet I can guess how you figured out it was, it was a lie. You were probably sitting in, uh, in the cafeteria one day in fourth or fifth grade, maybe third grade and uh, you know, you're, it's pizza Friday, right? You guys remember pizza Friday? For those of you that are homeschooled or your parents packed your lunch and you got to bring your own lunch to school every day, for us, for us peasants, like pizza day, pizza Friday was a big deal, okay? Pizza Friday was a big deal, like little cardboard piece. You know what, just Google it, You'll, you can find it. But anyways, you know, you're sitting there fourth and fifth grade, you're like not even like fully conscious yet, you know, but it's probably like November, December and, uh, and some kid just like walks up and sits next to you and just drops the bomb on you and he's just like, Santa's not real, man. Santa Claus is not real, right? And it's just like this, this universe shattering moment, at least it was for me. Some of you guys that your parents told you that Santa wasn't real when you were like, before, like as soon as you could talk, like we get it, you're better than us, okay? Yeah, you never bought into that lie. What about this one? And feel free to like shout out answers to this one. How long does it take to digest a piece of gum? Seven years, seven years right? That's, that's the answer I got too. It takes seven days, seven days to digest a piece of gum. That is a lie. Okay, what is the point of that lie? Why did they lie to us about that? What about this one? Feel free to shout it out again. What color is your blood before it hits oxygen? Blue, right? Maybe somebody says purple, right? No, it's just red. Maybe a little bit darker red, but it's still red, okay? Uh, that's a lie. Again, why? Why lie about that? What's the point of it? And this one's really like hits home for me, this lie, last one, uh, because I was really good at this thing, but uh, what did they used to tell you if you crossed your eyes too much, what was gonna happen? They're gonna get stuck that way, right? That's not true. That is not true. And I missed out on so many laughs growing up because I am, and still am good at crossing my eyes, okay? Missed out on a lot of laughs in elementary school. Uh, but it's funny to think about these lies, right? These lies that, uh, these silly little lies that we, that we were told growing up that don't really have that much of an impact on us. I don't, maybe the Santa Claus thing does. Maybe that really did some serious psychological damage to us in some way, but... But what I think is true is that I think there's actually a lot of lies that we are fed, especially in our young adulthood, that impact how we live, that impact how we live our lives. And I think that, like I said, I think there's a lot of lies and a lot of bad advice that we're fed. And, uh, and it lies like this. Tell me if you've heard this before. Hey, you should follow your heart, right? Have you all heard that one? Follow your heart. That's really bad. That could, that could probably be a whole nother message, right, about how bad of an advice it is to follow your heart. But what about this one? Hey, you do whatever makes you happy. Whatever's gonna make you happy, you do that. It's really bad advice. And really, I think a lie that encapsulates all of these bad, these bad ideas uh, is this. You have to have fun. You have to be having fun, especially those of you that are in your, everybody here's in their young adult years, right? Many of you are in college. You have to be having fun because if you're not, you're failing. If you're not having fun in life, you're failing. That's a lie. And it's a lie that, I, like I said, I think it encapsulates all, encapsulates all the other lies uh, that you could come up with about that influence how we live our lives, especially in our young adulthood. And so last week, Trevor kicked, did a great job kicking off this series that we're in. It's called, What's the Wise Thing to Do? And essentially what we've been doing is, is that we've been looking at some different topics. We're going to be looking at some different topics that, I, that we really believe that we've been fed lies about or we've been given bad advice about. And we're gonna ask the question, what is the wise thing to do? Or more importantly, what does God say that I should do when it comes to these topics? 
And so tonight, we're gonna specifically focus on the subject of soberness or being sober-minded. Now, before you roll your, I can, already, I, I can already sense that there's probably gonna be a few different reactions in the room to this topic, the topic of being sober-minded. One reaction might be that you're here and you think, hey, I don't struggle with this. I don't struggle with getting drunk. I don't struggle with drugs. This isn't for me, okay? I, I, get to, I can take the night off, right? This isn't for me. And to you, I would say, that there's a lot more to being sober-minded than just not doing drugs or drinking alcohol. There's so much more to it, and I hope we answer that question before we leave tonight. And the second reaction might be to say something along the lines of, hey, here we go again. He's gonna tell me I can't drink or smoke. This is why I stopped going to church. You know, More rules for me to follow. I'm not hurting anybody, so what's the big deal, right? Or maybe your reaction is to feel some sort of shame you know, hey, if these people find out, I just got drunk two nights ago. I just, I just smoked last night, maybe even today. Like, if these people find out about it, I'm not gonna be welcome here. And to you, I would say, the heart behind what I'm gonna be talking about today, the idea of soberness, it is not to shame anybody. This is something that is a huge part of my story, uh, drunkenness. For many years of my life, I was I was living a life that was defined, it really could be defined by drunkenness. Just every day I was just thinking about when's the next time I can go out and have a drink, uh, go to the bars, whatever it is. Uh, that, that's what defined my life for a lot of years. So my heart's not to shame you tonight. My heart's to say I've been there. I've been there and I've done that. And myself and so many other people here tonight have found a better way. And I just wanna tell you about that better way. That's the goal here tonight. And so, you know, like I said, this is a part of my story. And really, I've, I've bought into all the bad advice that there is out there about how we should live our life. About, again, like we said earlier, I, had to, I was trying to make sure I was happy because if I wasn't, I was failing. And so I bought into all the bad advice there is out there when it comes to sexual sin, to drunkenness. You name it, I've lived out the bad advice. Okay, so that's the heart behind what we're talking about tonight. And so the passage that we're gonna be looking at in Scripture tonight is 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn there. If you have a device, uh, you can turn there as well. And if you have the version app, the notes should be there as well. But 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. And the goal tonight, the passage that we're gonna be looking at in scripture, I think gives us a clear view of what it means to be sober-minded and what we should do with our time here on earth in order that we can, that's gonna help us be and live a life that's sober-minded. And so uh, let's go ahead and read this together. First Peter 4, seven through 11. It says, Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so the... the this is kind of my goal tonight. My goal tonight is to just kind of be really practical and I really just wanna answer three questions and I think this passage, Peter, answers three questions about the topic of soberness and being sober-minded. And the first question is this, what is it? What is soberness? Let's get really practical here. What does it mean to be sober or to be sober-minded? And so let's just define the opposite real quick. I think to define soberness, we need to look at its opposite. And I think we could all agree that the opposite of soberness is probably Drunkenness, right? So let's define that first. Drunkenness, pretty simple. It's the state of being intoxicated. And, uh, you know, in, 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 when the Bible was written, you know, there wasn't, uh, I don't think, the, the big problem in the Bible that's getting addressed oftentimes when it comes to soberness is, the, uh, is getting drunk, getting drunk especially on wine. The Bible explicitly says that that's something we shouldn't do. And today that's going to encompass, being intoxicated encompasses drinking alcohol, getting high, anything like that. That's what being drunk is. Okay, and, and God absolutely calls us to stay away from that. Okay, let's get, let's, like I said, the idea of soberness is bigger than that, but it absolutely encompasses that. Okay, so let's, let's be very, very clear about that. And let's, and let's just talk about why for a second. Like why, uh, why is it, why does the Bible say that we can't drink it? Like God made it, right? God made the, the alcohol and, the, and, the, and the, the ingredients that are in these drugs that can be abused, so why can't we do it? And I would say it's because if we're honest with ourselves, when we drink, we get intoxicated, we live a life that is, is in a, uh, defined by drunkenness, it's gonna cause us to be reckless. 
I could sit up here or stand up here and tell you story after story after story of really dumb things I did when I was intoxicated. Like nobody ever said, you've never heard this statement or at least you've never heard this statement honestly. I got really drunk last week and then I had some of the best prayer time I've ever had in my life, right? I, or I, I, I smoked last Tuesday and man, I went out and I shared the gospel with somebody and led somebody to Christ, right? Nobody, that's not true, okay? But if, if you at the very least, if you were, uh, tame about it, you went home and went to bed. That's probably the best case scenario, right? And so that's what drunkenness is. Uh, and, and if we live a life like that, we're gonna be reckless and God does not call us to live a reckless life. And so, like I said though, being sober-minded according to scripture is so much bigger than just not doing drugs, not drinking alcohol or getting drunk. The idea of soberness is bigger than that, and I think a good, solid, biblical definition of of what it means to be sober is this. It's living with a single-minded focus. Living with a single-minded focus. Or you could even write it this way, and we'll we'll kind of elaborate on what this means in a second, but it's living with eternity in view. Living a life where eternity is constantly in view, and every decision that you make is gonna be measured against that eternity that's in view. And so, like I said, it's, it's more than just drugs and alcohol. So be, living a sober-minded life, like think of anything in your life that, that is something that you do that, that keeps you from focusing on what really matters, that keeps you from living a life that is focused on eternity, okay? Uh, I'm just gonna name a few that pop off the top of my head and things that I either have or still struggle with today. One is social media, right? If you, think you, if you don't think that social media can cause you to not be sober-minded, we're fooling ourselves a little bit, right? And I think sober, social media can affect us in a few different ways. One, you're just a scroller, right? What do they call it, doom scrolling, right? Is that you? You just lay, like in the random points of the day or at night at least before you go to bed, you spend like three hours just watching Instagram reel after Instagram reel, okay? TikTok after TikTok. I am proud to say I never downloaded TikTok. I am standing firm. I'm gonna die on that hill, okay? But I just spent like, I just like doom scrolled on Instagram the other day, so it's really not any better, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell myself it is. Uh, but that's one way, right? And, and you, you, you're, whenever you're done doing that, when you're done scrolling, you are probably gonna be, have no energy to do anything that's of value, right? It's probably gonna affect your sleep, make you groggy the next day. Okay, so that's one thing that can keep us from being sober-minded. Or you're somebody that just puts out content. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with putting things out on the internet, but are you more concerned with getting likes and followers than you are focusing on the things that really matter? Maybe for you it's like binging shows, right? You're, you you, you kind of like to almost live in a different world a little bit or a, a lot of the time, right? Uh, maybe it's that. Maybe it's relationships, Maybe what keeps you from living a sober-minded life is relationships because whether that's a relationship with, with a significant other or with your friends, uh, you're more concerned about being th- this certain type of boyfriend or this certain type of girlfriend or this certain member of the friend group, right? Like you have the funny guy, you have the, you have the guy that never takes anything seriously. I don't know, you, you, you kind of know the standard roles in every friend group, right? Maybe that's where you're kind of finding your identity and you focus more on that than things that really matter. I don't know what it is for you, but again, there's so many things that can keep us from living a sober-minded life. And so, I kinda wanna get a little real with you here for a second. Uh, Like I said, my life was defined by drunkenness for a long time, uh, especially in my college years. And and one thing that not being sober-minded does is if we live a life that's not sober-minded, we are going to be blinded to the realities of the world. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and unfortunately, a decision that I made in college, uh, I, I had been drinking and, and I decided it was gonna be a good idea to get behind the wheel of a vehicle and drive across town. And uh, man, talk about drunkenness blinding you from the realities of life, right? It blinded me from the reality that one, uh, I'm at the, I could get pulled over, right? I could get arrested, I could go to jail, I'd, I, could, I was pursuing an education degree to be a teacher, that's, that's gonna be at least a lot harder. Uh, I was on the football team at the university that I was at, I'm probably gonna get kicked off of that, if not just kicked out of the entire university to get all together. And then like, worst case scenario, what if I would've wrecked and hurt myself or killed somebody else? Because of my drunkenness, I was completely blinded to all of these realities. And it's so easy to do it with other things too. And so, uh, you know, there's not just these physical realities. 
that are out there. There's not, yes, there is the reality that if I would have got pulled over, I was gonna go to jail, all those things, right? Uh, There's that reality, but there's also a spiritual reality to the world as well. There's this spiritual war going on all around us that we can't see. Sometimes we can see it, if we're honest, but you know, most of the time it kind of goes unseen, but it's there and it's very real. And uh, Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, he, he says this, he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So, and, and it's not just there, it's all over scripture that there's a spiritual war going on. There's an enemy that's there and he would absolutely love it if he, 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 here's the deal, he doesn't need you to like, like serve him. He doesn't need you to be like, Satan, I'm here and you know, like I'm here to do whatever you want me to do, right? That's not what he needs. He would absolutely love it if we lived our entire lives just chasing after pleasure, after pleasure, after pleasure, trying to do whatever's gonna make me happy in that moment, he will accept that as worship, okay? And that's a life that's meaningless. And, and Peter even says it later on in this same book in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So there is a spiritual reality to this world that if we are not sober-minded, we will be blind to. We will be blind to the fact that the enemy is just sitting there behind the scenes laughing at us, saying, you keep doing what you're doing. You keep chasing whatever you think, that whatever they tell you is gonna make you happy. And so when we do that, we're blinded. We're, when we, when we, we're not sober-minded, we're blinded to that reality. So that's what, that's what being sober is. We've, okay, hopefully we've defined what soberness is, what it means to be sober-minded. The second question I hope to answer tonight is how to be sober-minded. How do we live a life that is sober-minded? And so let's look here at what uh, Peter says in verses eight through 11. Again, really quickly, he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And so, as believers, Peter gives us a pretty solid list of things here that we are supposed to do. He says we're supposed to love one another earnestly. He says love covers a multitude of sins. Have you ever met somebody who is just, they, are, they just love people, right? They love people. You can see it. They just exude love. When they walk in the room, they're not a here I am person. They're a hey, there you are. And you just know when you leave, when you leave the presence of that person, you are going to be filled up, right? We all probably have at least one, hopefully we all have at least one person in our life that's like that. And uh, when, when Peter says, you know, love covers a multitude of sins, if that person were to one day wrong you, do something that offended you, or, uh, you know, they did something to you that was wrong, you would, because that person is so loving most of the time, they would be, that you would be like, I know that's not them, right? That's, they didn't mean that. Maybe they were just having an off day. Like love covers a multitude of sins. Somebody who's loving, it's gonna be easy. If we are loving, it's gonna be easier for that person to overlook a wrong that we may do. And so he also tells us to show hospitality without grumbling, use gifts to serve one another. And here's the deal. As Christians, we're not just called to be good. You know what I mean? We're not just called to like not do bad stuff, okay? So many people look at this book, right? And they see like a rule book. Like you're supposed to just be good. Don't, God's watching. He's wagging his finger. Don't you dare. Don't you dare do that. That's not what this book is, okay? And as Christians, like I said, we're not just called to be good. And I, I want to give you a little illustration to hopefully, like, get our minds around that, right? How many of you guys remember your first breakup? Some of you, it's still fresh. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to bring up those feelings, okay? I'm not talking about, like, your first elementary school breakup, right? Like, I, I do remember that one, too. No matter how many notes I wrote, or I even gave her candy, she still broke up with me, okay? But I'm talking about like your first breakup. I'm talking like you probably like your first, it was probably in high school, right? You probably thought you were gonna marry that person, okay? Uh, and I'll tell you this, I was 17 or 18 years old when I had my first breakup, and man, doesn't it, oh, it hurts, doesn't it? Like at the time, it's just like, I, I am never gonna get over this. This is the end. I'm never gonna find anybody to love me again. This is awful. Uh, and when this happened to me, I was thinking about stuff I never even thought about when I was with her. I was like, Man, what are what, what our kids have looked like, right? Like, this is the end. Like, I'm never gonna find somebody this amazing. 
And, uh, and even a couple years later, you look back and you're like, wow, why did I care that much about that relationship? But at the time, it's, it hurts. It's really, really hard. And so, uh, yeah, I just remember sitting in my room all day, every day, for like two weeks. And have you ever done this? Have you ever tried to sit and not think about something? Like it's it's kind of like when you lay in bed at night and you try to like, you really want to fall asleep, so you're sitting there like, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep, and it just doesn't happen. But when you lay there and you say, I've got to stay awake, that's when you fall asleep. But uh, that's what I did. I just sat in my room all the time, and I was trying to not think about how much this breakup hurt. And finally, one day, my dad walks in the room, and he just goes, dude, you've got to get out of the house. You cannot just sit around and just try to not think about this. Okay, and what happened? As soon as I got out of the house and I went and hung out with some friends, he's like, just go do stuff, go do something. I was probably dragging him down too after I'd think about it. And what happened? As soon as I got out of the house, like I almost immediately got over it. Almost immediately got over it. And I can even sit up here 10 years, I'm giving away my age, sorry. Five, four years ago, that happened. <laughs> and uh, and I, can, I can sit here and joke with you about it. And, uh, and it's not a big deal, right? But at the time it was. And I say that to say, like I said, we as Christians are not just called to be good. And if we sit here and we just try to white knuckle this life, right? Like I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna be really, really good. I'm just not gonna do bad stuff. You're gonna fail, I promise you. We're gonna fail even if we do it the right way. You're certainly gonna fail if that's how you try to go about it. Okay, and what I think Peter does here is I think Peter gives us a clear look at what we should be doing. Again, we should be encouraging one another. We should be gathering in spaces like this. This is, am- this is rare, guys. This is awesome that we do this. And if it's your first time here, I'm so glad you're here. And you're, you are so welcome. Uh, and we're so glad you're here. And, and this is amazing. This is what Peter says that we should do. We should gather. You know we, what should be happening in spaces like this? Is we should be encouraging. Yes, we're coming to learn about God and what his word says. But we're also here to spur one another on in our faith. Like, like encourage one another. Like, hey, yeah, like this world is still not as it should be, right? Life gets really hard sometimes, but God is good. We're here to encourage one another. And we're also here to show the love of Jesus to others. And I hope, again, if this is your first time here and you came in today, I hope that you were made to feel welcome and wanted because we really are genuinely so glad that you are here. And that's what Peter calls us to do. We're also called to use our gifts to expand the kingdom of God. Every single one of you, if you're a believer, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you have a gift. God has bestowed on you gifts and you should find out what those gifts are and you should walk in them and you should use them to expand his kingdom. And so that's what we should do. We're not called to just sit around and be good. We're called to be godly. That's what we're called to be. And so before we move on to the last question, I just want to get like really practical for a second, right? Since we're talking about drunkenness and soberness, I want to get really, really practical because I can hear it now because I can think back to what I thought when I first started to follow Jesus, right? I remember thinking like, hold on, dude, like the Bible does not say I cannot drink, okay? Like Jesus drank wine. Jesus turned water into wine. That was his first miracle. I can hear it all now, okay? And I'd say, hey, calm down, okay, calm down. And I would just say this, let's just, let's just ask the question, like, what is, when is it okay to drink? And I think there's, really, there's three really helpful questions that we should ask ourselves when it comes to topics like this. And really, they're questions that could be applied to a lot of different things, like things that maybe aren't necessarily explicitly, uh, we're told we can't do in scripture, but like, it's gray. You know what I mean? Those gray area things, and drinking is one of them. But I think these three questions could be helpful. So... When you're navigating this topic, ask yourself these questions. The first one, based on your past, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams, should you do this? Should I do this? And again, we should we can ask ourselves that question when it comes to should I have can I can I have a drink? Should I sit and play video games until three in the morning? Is that going to affect how I, uh, I'm, that's just me, I'm sorry. The fellas in here get that, right? That's something we can easily do, right? Is spend, go play. Video game time passes a lot faster than regular time. Like three hours in video game time is like 20 minutes in real life. Or yeah, flip that, but you get it. And so is this going to, based on your past, like do you have a past of struggling with, alcohol, with getting drunk? Is that something that you struggle with? Then maybe it's not a good idea for you. Your current circumstances, where, where you're at in life now, is this a good idea for me to, to, to do this thing? And based on my future hopes and dreams, should I do this? You have to be really honest with yourselves to answer these questions. The second question is this. Is this gonna cause somebody else to stumble? 
Is this going to cause somebody else to stumble? And again, you have to be honest with yourself here. Is there, are, are the people you're with, do you know them? If you don't know them, the answer is probably no. I shouldn't do this. Maybe you do know them. Maybe you know that they struggle with something, right? They struggle with you, you know, drugs, drinking, whatever it may be. Then is it going to cause them to stumble if I have one? Shouldn't do it. We don't want to do it if it's going to cause somebody else to stumble. And the last question is this. Is this going to help or hurt me in representing Christ? Is this going to help me? or hurt me in representing Christ. That pe- somebody watching you who knows you're a believer, they don't know that you're just going to have one. Like it's not, a, you know, it's not something you struggle with. I don't struggle with this. They're going to think one of two things. They're going to think, hypocrite, he's a Christian. He shouldn't be doing that. That's why I'm not a Christian. Hypocrite, right? That's one thing they could think. And uh, the other thing that they could think is, uh, hey, I can be a Christian and I can get drunk, right? Two things that are not true. You didn't mean to put that message out there, but that's the message that they see. And so you might be thinking like, man, based off those three questions, I should probably, I don't think I can ever do it. Maybe, there's nothing wrong with that. And if that's something that really rubbed, like if that's something that is, that doesn't sit well with you, like that's, we, we should do a little bit of hard examination there. And again, I'm, I'm saying that with love. Like I'm, I'm from somebody who has struggled with this himself, Okay, if that rubs you the wrong way, like we need to do a little bit of a hard examination. Why does that rub me the wrong way? And so again, I hope that that's practical. Those are practical questions that we can all ask ourselves when it comes to this topic. And the last question that I wanna answer tonight is this. We've talked about what it is to be sober. We've talked about how to do it, but why? Why should we be sober-minded? Uh, Peter in the second half of verse 11 here, he says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. So Peter says it, he says, in everything we do, we are to glorify God. And that's not the, again, this is not the only place this is said in scripture. Everything we do should bring glory to God. And you know, we've mentioned it a lot tonight too. What sober-minded is, is we, we live with a single-minded focus. We live with eternity in view. What is the single-minded focus? What is this eternity that we need to keep in view? And I think Jesus, in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, lays this focus out clearly. What is this thing that we need to be single-minded, fo- mindedly focused on? He says this. The Pharisees have just asked him, teacher, like, what's, what is the greatest law? What's the most important law? And he says this, he says to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what's the single-minded focus? Our focus should be, we were created for a purpose, and that purpose is to love God and love people. Jesus says it, it's right there. He says all the other laws in the Old Testament can be summed up in those two. We are to love God and we are to love others. And so if you're here tonight and you haven't discovered this truth for yourself, you're stuck like living that life of just chasing pleasure after pleasure, you're chasing happiness. I just wanna ask you, and again, with a lot of love and a lot of humility, like let's be honest, like how is that going for you? How is that going for you? Because I wanna tell you how it went for me. How it went for me in, in those years where I was getting drunk and, and going to the bars and the clubs and all these things, I wanna be honest about something. I had a lot of fun. I had fun. I'm gonna be honest. I'm not gonna lie. But here's the deal. That sense of satisfaction and gratification that I got from it didn't last very long. Didn't last very long. And what's even, what's even crazier is the more I did it, the more I went out and pursued those things, every time I did it, that gratification, satisfaction, a little bit shorter. Not quite as much the next time. Kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And finally, I just started to wonder, like, is this really what life is about? Is this really it? And you can go out and find endless famous people, people that had wealth, power, fame, maybe a combination of them. You can go out and find, and there's a huge list of people that had those things, and they say the same thing. There's got to be more than this. This cannot be all there is. And, and, and they're right, there's not. But 
my weeks even became meaningless. Like I remember I was, again, this, especially after college, I was a teacher. Like I'm in a classroom full of my first couple of years, like junior high students, seventh and eighth graders. And yet my weeks were becoming meaningless. Like my life, uh, I was living for the weekend, right? Like my days, I was just literally thinking, I'm supposed to be molding and shaping these young minds. And all I can think about is I cannot wait to get home this weekend for Friday to be here so I can go have another drink. And my weeks became meaningless. And that's really sad that that happened. And, and what's crazy is, is I had a friend at the time who kept telling me about this young adult's ministry. He kept telling me about this young adult's ministry. And I, I grew up in church for like a little bit of my life. So I kind of knew that ministry was like a churchy word that had something to do with church. But I also knew this person. And I was like, I knew enough about church to think, I'm, I know the life that you and I live. And it's, I don't really think, why are you talking to me about God right now, right? Like, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And, uh, and so he kept telling me about this young adults ministry though. And one, one day in the summer, I was, uh, I was driving home from Texas from visiting my mom and I had a six hour drive on my hands back here, to, back here to Springfield. And I thought, okay, like I got nothing better to do. I'm in the truck by myself, so I'll, I'll listen to it. And I was pulled out my phone and pulled out the old podcast app. And I started scrolling through this young adults ministry and uh, came across two messages. And one of them was called uh, Drunkenness and Soberness. And so isn't it crazy that uh, listening to a ministry that is similar to this one, a gathering of young adults on Tuesday nights uh, in a, on a subject similar to the one we're talking about tonight, that is what God used to reach down into my life and just flip a, flip a switch. Like for the first time in my life, somebody in a loving way exposed me to my sin and showed me that there is a better way to live this life. There's a reason why these things you're chasing after are not satisfying you. Because you weren't made for that. You were made for something better. And I just remember having this thought, I had a lot of thoughts going through my head and I'm a, I'm a little embarrassed to admit as a grown man, I was just bawling my eyes out in my truck by myself. And I just, this thought was the one that, that I really remember the most. It was just, I thought, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Because the, the irony of this whole thing is that my whole entire life, if you would have asked me if I was a Christian, I would have said, yes, absolutely, I'm a Christian. But nothing in my life gave evidence to that, nothing, unless you would have asked me, and then you would have been like, okay. And so what did I do about that? What did I do? Well, when I got home, I didn't just keep doing the same thing. I didn't just keep living the same life. When I got home, I had a roommate at the time, and I always give him a lot of credit because he could have, I, I came home and I said, hey, I think we need to just like go find a church or something. Like we just need to, we need to do something different because this is not working out. And if he would have said no, then I, I, I probably would have fizzled out eventually and just went back to living the same old life. But he didn't, praise God. By the grace of God, he said, yeah, man, let's do that. And we, we looked, got online and nobody had invited us to a church or anything. We just got online and honestly found the first church who we thought their website looked good. And we, uh, we said, all right, let's go try that one. They've got a young adults ministry. So we went. We didn't just sit at home and try to be good, right? We didn't just sit at home and try to change our behavior. We went, we found new community, we found new friends. We started doing things that we hadn't, doing different things with our time than we did before with those new friends. And God started to work in us. And, and for me, it wasn't overnight, I'll tell you that. I made a lot, of, still do obviously make a lot of mistakes, still a sinner. But God started to work on my heart and he started to, to, to change me over time to the point where I can look back now all these years later and I can see, I can, it, it literally feels like a different life. Like I've lived it, like I have the memories of this form of the things I used to do, but it feels like, like I've been, I mean, like I've been reborn. It really feels like that. And the reality is, is that's true. I'd found my purpose. And so, if you're here tonight and you haven't discovered your purpose in life, there it is. That's your purpose. You were made to love God and you were made to love people. That's your purpose. The worst thing we could do with our life is spend our life chasing after pleasures, chasing after happiness, chasing after what's, what we think is gonna make us happy. It's the worst thing you could do. And as I said earlier, there's an enemy that would love for you to do that. He is so satisfied with you doing that. And if you're here tonight and you're asking the question or you've been thinking about, I assume if you're here tonight you may, for the first time, you, you may have some questions and you may be thinking like, what I've been doing has not been working out for me and you're here to try something new. And, I, and again, I just wanna say welcome. 
And don't, if you have questions, don't leave here tonight without asking. We would love nothing more but to help you process through what it looks like to follow Jesus. And if you're hearing this tonight and you're feeling again, if you're feeling some sort of shame or guilt, that is not at all what the purpose of this is. Again, I, I, this is a part of my story. But even more important than that is God wants to forgive you for that. If you're feeling like a weight of, of shame or guilt, God wants to forgive you for that. And what's so amazing is that uh, God is not distant. He's not some faraway God who just created the world and then said, all right, you guys messed it up. You got to figure it out on your own. Praise God, that's not what he did. But God, instead, he, he came to be near to us. He, he just, even though he didn't have to, out of his infinite grace and mercy, he decided to become a man, put on flesh, come down to earth, and deal with all the same temptations and struggles that we deal with. Just because he was fully man, but also fully God, he still dealt with the temptation. He still dealt with, the, with, with pain and physical pain and, and, and heartbreak and all these things. He still dealt with all of it. But he did it and he lived a sin, sinless, perfect life in order that we could be made right with God, in order that God, we could be adopted into, to be sons and daughters of God. He bridges the gap that our sin creates. And all you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is just admit that. Say, God, I, I, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner, that you're a perfect and holy God. I have sinned against a perfect and holy God and I don't deserve it, but for some reason, in his infinite love and mercy and grace, you have given me a way to be, to be right with you and that is through your son, Jesus Christ. And I choose to make him the Lord of my life. I choose to submit to that. It's simple, right? It's a gift. It's so simple and all you have to do is accept it. And so I just ask if you wouldn't mind if you just bow your heads and... Uh, I, just wanna, I just wanna ask, and if there's anybody here tonight, if, if, if you're, you're listening to this and you've been living a life that you're, you're chasing after happiness, you're chasing after the next thing that's gonna make you happy, and you've realized that it's, not the, it's, it's just not working out, if, if, if you've heard the, the story that, of Jesus tonight and you, and you wanna give your life to him, if you wanna say, I'm done trying to do this on my own, I need your help, Jesus. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I promise you there's never gonna be anything that you can do in this life that's gonna, that's gonna make you feel fulfilled. I see those hands. Nothing in this life is gonna make you feel the joy, the peace, and the hope that comes with following Jesus. And so I would just ask you to pray, pray a prayer like this. And God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I realize my need for a savior. And I thank you, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to make, provide a way for, you, for me to be right with you. And, I, and, I, and Jesus, I just, I wanna surrender. I wanna make you the Lord of my life. I choose to follow you today. And I would ask if you prayed that prayer, don't leave here today without talking to somebody. Here in a moment, we're gonna, we're gonna worship again and I would, there's gonna be leaders up here at the front and I would encourage you, come down. Talk to them. Tell them the decision you just made. Ask them to, to help you process what that looks like. And if you don't wanna get up and walk down in front of a bunch of people, I get that. You don't have to. After service, there's gonna be people at Next Steps. Go talk to somebody. Don't make that decision and then just walk out. Let us help you process that. And, and the last thing, uh, if you are here and you're, maybe you are following Jesus, but you've fallen into that sin struggle of, of drunkenness or whatever, anything, anything that is keeping you from living a life that's focused on eternity, there's grace for that. God wants to, God is going, all we have to do is repent. You just have to, to, to ask God to forgive you for that and he will. And then you need to, you need to surround yourself with people, like-minded people, other believers that are gonna help keep you accountable. And, and I'm telling you, Life will be so much, it's not gonna be easier, but it's gonna be better. You're gonna have hope, you're gonna have joy, you're gonna have peace. And so uh, I just wanna pray and then we can, we can stand and worship. And again, if you wanna come and respond after this, uh, you can do that. But uh, Father, thank you so much that you make it so clear in your word that what, the life that we need to live in order to, to be sober-minded. And I pray that you would, 
whatever decisions need to be made tonight, if somebody in here needs to just start serving or just change who they're spending their time with or what they're doing with their time, that you would, you would put it on their hearts to do that, God. Help them to get involved, to, uh, help them to, to start serving, to just doing the things that you have called us to do. Help us to live sober-minded lives focused on you, Jesus. You're the most important thing. God, I thank you for this community. I thank you for uh, giving us the, the time and the space to gather like this and just be encouraged and to spur one another on in our faith. And uh, we just love you so much, God. We, certain, we don't deserve it, but you've been so good to us. It's in Jesus' name.